morning. Please be seated. We are here for oral arguments in cause number CV 170768, Walsh Alexis et al. versus Arizona Board of Funeral Directors and Embalmers. These proceedings are being video and audio recorded, so we ask counsel to please identify yourself and your client at the beginning of your argument. Each side will have 20 minutes. Appellant's counsel is responsible for watching the clock to reserve a portion of that time for rebuttal if desired. Also, we have read the briefs, we have conferenced the case, so you can assume that we know what you're talking about. And at this point, I'd say, counsel, please proceed. May it please the court, my name is Charles Burry. I represent the appellants in this case. If I may, I'd like to reserve three minutes of my time for rebuttal. There are a number of issues in this case, but the most perplexing, the most disturbing, is the, the bias and the prejudice that the board exhibited toward the plaintiffs. Even before, and I say plaintiffs, appellants, even before charges were brought against them, the board's executive director was telling people that the appellants were going down. Their licenses were going to be revoked. People didn't want them in the industry. And in making those threats, the executive director was acting in his official capacity. He was speaking on behalf of the board. And if there's any doubt about that, let's look at the behavior of the board in this case. When the board was advised of the executive director's threats, it summarily dismissed them. It was no surprise to them. It was meaningless. What did the board do? It turned around and filed charges against the appellants. And then the appellants asked the board to recuse itself from the administrative process and to allow the administrative law judges recommended decision to become the final decision of the case. But you're not suggesting that the charges themselves were, uh, were frivolous. The, the administrative law judge found them to be substantiated. In part, and we do contest a number of those in our briefs, but the fact of the matter is, why were the charges brought against the appellants in the first place? Well, I, because there was substantiated evidence that was found by the ALJ that has nothing to do with your claim. I mean, the, the executive director may have made some comments, but the board is the one who found there was enough to refer to the ALJ, and the ALJ substantiated the claims. So that's why they were brought. Okay, so let's assume there's a le legitimate basis to bring the complaint. We, we move things along. We asked the board to recuse itself from the uh, hearing process. The board refuses. Rather than allow for the perception of complete fairness in light of the executive director's threats, the board wanted to control the outcome of the case. And ultimately, it exercised that authority to do exactly what the executive director threatened. When the administrative law judge came back with her recommendation to suspend the appellant's licenses for a brief period of time and then place them on probation, the board rejected that notion and did exactly what the executive director said would happen. It revoked the appellant's licenses. I submit that the unfairness inherent in these circumstances was, was intolerably high. I mean, look at the facts. The outcome of this case was a faith accompli from the very beginning. Could we talk about the actual charges for a minute? Sure. Um, what is there in the record that would indicate that the appellants were on notice that stacking was was a violation of the their their license? At the time it occurred, they were not on notice. It only came to their attention after the board and I think it was prior to the, the filing of the complaint, took the position that stacking was not to be done in Arizona. But back in the summer of 2015, the board had not taken a position on the issue. Are there any regulations that would indicate stacking is inappropriate? Not expressly, no. None there, whatsoever. Are there any regulations that specifically adopt uh, some type of trade standard or something like that that would indicate that, that stacking was inappropriate? None whatsoever. 
But the the experts that testified on your client's behalf seem to all suggest that that stacking is not something that they would do, and that it that it is a professional standard. I would disagree with you, Your Honor. The board's witnesses, and there were four, did testify that, uh, in their opinions, stacking was uh, was contrary to prevailing practices. But it's kind of interesting. They left it at that. They never said it was contrary to prevailing practices in Arizona in the summer of 2015. And the reason why, they didn't have the background or experience to render that opinion. If you look at Mr. Starks, one of the board's expert witnesses, he never practiced in Arizona. He had been licensed elsewhere, and he had practiced for a long time, but he was not familiar with standards and practices. So is there a different standard in Arizona on that issue? Well, we don't know. What, what was the best evidence presented on your client's behalf that, that it was not a standard? Well, you had 10 witnesses who testified that stacking was common and was acceptable in thought, Arizona during this period of time. They didn't, they didn't do it. I beg your pardon. I thought the witnesses said they didn't do it. They're like, oh, yeah, some, people may be, they do it, but I wouldn't do it. Some did. Some did. Some were straightforward and said, hey, listen, it, it, it happens. It's been done for a long time. We do it. Others said, listen, it happens. It's been done for a long time. We don't think it's right, and we don't do it. Anyone said that we're currently doing it? This is something that is currently being done, and, and, and in my view, it's it meets professional standards. I do. If I recall correctly, I think Sandy Greenlee testified to that effect. Did any of your expert witnesses say that they currently engaged in stacking in their business? I, again, I believe Mrs. Greenlee uh, gave that testimony. Okay. But would that would that be a judgment call by the uh, the fact finder to if if there's one or two people who say that this meets the standard, but uh, ten people say no, it doesn't. Uh, would we substitute our judgment for the ALJ and the board? Well, the question is, was there substantial evidence that stacking? was contrary to prevailing practices in the funeral industry in Arizona in the summer of 2015. None of the board's witnesses gave that testimony. But why, why would it be different in Arizona than nationally stacking? Why, why would that be a different? Why would that be unique to Arizona? Your, Your Honor, I could only offer surmise. I don't know. You know, every state is different. We have different laws, different practices, um, different sensitivities. So I don't know the answer to that. But are, are you saying we should ignore testimony from national, uh, from experts who aren't in Arizona on that issue? Um, is, is there, if, absent some indication that there's something unique about Arizona with regard to stacking? Your Honor, if there was a national standard, it was incumbent upon the board to have the witnesses testify to that effect. I mean, it, the burden of proof was on them to demonstrate what the prevailing practice was in Arizona in the summer of 2015, and they f absolutely failed in that regard. On the other hand... Only because they didn't say in Arizona, they just said this is the standard, but they didn't say in Arizona? They, they Yeah, I, I think that's, that's absolutely correct. Uh, they would have us assume that the national standard or whatever standard they're familiar with is what's acceptable in Arizona. And, you know, that's a leap of logic. There's got to be evidence to that effect. I'd like to get back, if I may, to the denial of fairness, because I think... Oh, let's stick with this for okay. a minute, because I, I really want to press this for a minute. It, was there anything in the evidence beyond just stacking? I mean, was there any evidence that any of these boxes broke or anything, or um, there were... None whatsoever. Fluid stripping or anything like that? How about bending, anything like that? Oh, I think there was testimony that uh, Mrs. Moreno saw some containers uh, in the back of a transit vehicle, and I think she opined that they may have started to bend on the corners or something like that. It wasn't terribly specific, but I do recall something to that effect. But w did anything ever on toward ever happen as a result of stacking? There was no evidence to that effect. In fact, the evidence was just to the contrary, that nothing on toward ever occurred. And I think you can look at the uh, testimony of Ms. Welsh Lexis and Mr. Warner to that effect. If I may then, I'll turn my attention back to what I see as the unfairness. Well, I, I don't mean to keep pestering you, but I am going to. <laughs> Let's assume for the sake of argument that uh, 
the, we find that the stacking was not adequately proven. Does that mean that we have to remand, or, uh, or do you believe that there has to be a, a reversal on other allegations that were made in order for there to be a remand? Your Honor, I think the board's decision and order is rife with problems. But what about the, if, if, if we find that there was a violation of the refrigeration uh, requirement, um, would that be enough to, uh, to affirm the, uh, the, court, the board's decision? I think not, Your Honor, because it just wasn't on that basis that the board chose to revoke the appellant's licenses. Uh, also included was the stacking issue, um, uh, transport, transport, so things of that have sort. To remand if we find that there was a basis for a violation of the refrigeration directive, but not. Uh, I believe so. I believe so because I think that it's required that the board then reconsider its decision in light of the fewer number of infractions. And, well, and I guess as was the genesis of my question is, given the number of infractions, if we focus only on and find, well, okay, we're, we're not in agreement on the stacking, given the other number, is, isn't it an act of futility to send it back? Well, it depends on whether the board is going to be fair and objective. I mean, if the board exhibits the same bias and prejudice it did at the onset of this case, it would be a futile act. The onset of this case, simply making charges, um, why, why does that necessarily establish bias when they, they, the infractions were found by the, the ALJ? The infractions were found, but it gets back to the idea of, okay, assuming there were infractions, what do you do about it? What do you do about it? You know, disciplinary action isn't exacted for the purpose of punishment. It's exacted for the protection of the public. So. I think that's the real question. What needs to be done? The evidence was that, for example, in terms of stacking, that the appellants had stopped stacking before the board brought charges against them once they learned of the board's position. And when it comes to the issue of refrigeration, there was only three instances in which people said they observed containers outside the refrigeration unit. Wasn't it also a math issue, though, with, in terms of the, the numbers? I, I thought the states... Uh, the, the board's position was that there, there's no way this could have happened. That, that's just the number of times people saw it, but based on the numbers that went through, they couldn't have all been refrigerated properly. You're talking about uh, Ms. Stapley's report, the board's investigator, and that too was rife with error. Um, her accounting initially didn't take, care, didn't take into account the containers that were cremated each day. When we brought that out, other problems surfaced. Uh, she didn't uh, take into account when <laughs> containers were added to the cremation list. Was it when people called and said they're ready for pickup and cremation, or was it when they were delivered? Ms. Stapley also assumed, wrongly, that each container remained in the possession of Saguaro for at least one day, when oftentimes the containers came to Saguaro, they were cremated that same day. And besides that, and probably the most problematic part of her calculation was she didn't take into account that some containers may have contained the remains of infants and body parts and things like that. The containers are much smaller. The refrigeration unit could hold many more. So that accounting, I don't think, went, went anywhere. I don't think uh, the uh, administrative law judge was persuaded by that, and I think that's reflected in her findings of fact. Oh, I didn't read it that way. I mean, I have to be honest with you. I read the ALJ to find it per persuasive. That in conjunction with, with the testimony that, that of the people that actually saw the refrigeration. Mm -hmm. I mean, she specifically found that there was a violation of the refrigeration re requirement. Well, she did. She did. And But I would submit wrongfully so. When you look at what occurred, you had this hostile funeral director go to the uh, Suoro. He says he saw containers outside the uh, refrigeration unit on two visits. It happens to be the same number of containers on the same number of gurneys. And then you see we have the uh, testimony of the board's investigator who went there once and saw containers outside the refrigeration unit. Interestingly enough, neither of these individuals asked why are the containers outside the refrigeration unit. The council, all of that was presented to ALJ, and the ALJ made a determination. 
And you're not asking us to substitute our judgment for the ALJ who no, actually I'm heard the evidence and made a finding. I'm asking you to find that there was no substantial evidence that these observations justify the finding that containers were not kept in refrigeration. That's the issue. Was there substantial evidence to that point? Well, where you have testimony that says they're outside, that the refrigeration unit is not on, no one is there, why isn't that enough for us to defer to the, the ALJ's finding? Well, again, the fact that containers were seen outside is explainable because as the evidence... But explainable, that means that, that that's where we typically defer. It's somebody has an explanation. The, the ALJ didn't, didn't accept that explanation. Why, why would we substitute our judgment there? Again, I would submit that the testimony adduced on that issue wasn't substantial. Um, would this be a good time to talk about a couple other issues? You can talk about whatever you want. <laughs> I only have a couple more minutes left before I reserve. I wanted to talk about uh, the board's finding that uh, the appellants violated the Department of Health Services rule, uh, former rule 9-19-301, or excuse me, 302. That was a rule that the board read as requiring a disposition transit permit to identify the place where cremation would take place. The permits at issue did not, some did not identify Soro as the place where cremation would occur and accordingly the board found that the appellants had violated that rule. But if we go back and look at the rule, the rule doesn't say what the board said it said. The rule only required disposition transit permits to identify the means of disposition. In this case it would be cremation. Didn't require the disposition transit permit to identify where the cremation would occur. So there was no, no violation of that rule. Uh, isn't there not, is there not a problem with stating inaccurately on a, uh, avowing something happened here when it didn't happen here or misidentifying the location? There was no avowal made by Saguaro or the appellants. There, there's a signature on a, on a form that that's, that states something that's inaccurate, right? Well, the, 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 tr the permits themselves are completed by the um, funeral home that transmits the containers to Saguaro for cremation. But the rule doesn't require the transit permit to state where cremation is going to take place. So if the rule doesn't require that, how can you conclude that the appellants violated the rule? It just doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense whatsoever. Um, I want to talk about the, the, um, the actions that were taken against um, Welsh Lexus and Lambert's funeral director and um, cremationist, excuse me, um, embalmer's licenses. They didn't work at Saguaro as an embalmer or funeral director. Swar is a crematory. It doesn't do funeral directing. It doesn't do embalming. It only does cremationists. So there was no basis for the board to act against those other licenses. Now, the board argues that, hey, the appellants can't compartmentalize their conduct. But when you look at the licensing uh, that takes place in terms of the funeral industry, embalmers, funeral directors, Cremationists are all licensed separately. It's done individually, and they're employed likewise. So just because someone may have done something wrong uh, as a cremationist doesn't mean that that exposes their funeral director or embalmer's licenses to discipline. Even and, if it's something that goes to the dignity of the deceased? Well, you know, I would love to have the time to talk about dignity and respect because I would submit that those standards are unconstitutionally vague and unenforceable given the uh, Ninth Circuit and Fifth Circuit's decisions regarding abortion rules that use similar language. Um, I might mention just briefly, because I think I have a minute 22 left, that when it came to the revocation of Warner's cremationist license, here again we have something that just doesn't match up with, with law. His license had lapsed months earlier, and as a matter of law it no longer existed, but yet the board decided, hey, we can't suspend it, so we'll revoke it. Well, unless you have explicit statutory authority to act against a lapsed license, you can't do it. 
some agencies have that authority. You would suggest anybody that was undergoing investigation by a disciplinary board to simply delay the proceeding until their license expired? I wouldn't suggest it, but it happens. And if the person should reapply later on, certainly those circumstances could be brought up in terms of whether the individual should be relicensed. You bring them up if you haven't if you haven't gone through the process already. If you wait, say, if you just wait three or four years, there's no more, uh, the evidence is no longer available. That, that seems like an odd remedy. You don't know that to be the case. I mean, it could well be, be present. Um, I'd like to reserve a few seconds, so thank you very much. Thank you. Council. <clears throat> Uh, may it please the court, Tom Rain appearing on behalf of the board, sorry, Arizona Board of Funeral Directors and Embalmers. Could you start with the stacking? Yes. And, and let us know what is it that puts uh, puts people like appellants on notice that s stacking is improper? Well, I'll start out by saying that uh, appellants are correct that there is no Arizona law or administrative code provision that specifically uses the phrase stacking. They were disciplined under Rule 412-301-A1, which prohibit, which, which states, quote, licensees shall, engage, licensees shall not engage in any conduct which causes or results in disrespect for the deceased person, uh, ellipsis, I'll skip the other parts, doesn't it? Contrary to the prevailing standards and practices of the profession in this state. Uh, the appellant's argument is that that statute is, un is constitutionally vague and that it's basically, there's no- you Focus on the prevailing standards. Yes. Because if if yes. it's just disrespectful, that does seem pretty vague. But what, are, what evidence is there that it is the prevailing standard in Arizona not to stack? Okay, let me. Well, I'll, I'll go through some of our witnesses. Um, the board, uh, on behalf of the board, one, two, three, four, five. We had at least five witnesses testify as to the prevailing standards of the, of the profession with regard to stacking. Uh, first, I'll talk about the Arizona-specific ones because that appears to be one of the, one of the arguments uh, against this discipline. Um, Gary Hendricks, who is the board's licensed administrator and, and, and investigator, testified that in his, on his tenure of the board, he had investigated nearly every funeral home and crematory within the state of Arizona over a number of years and that these were surprise inspections where you just show up and knock on the door and, and look at the facility. He also testified that stacking was something that when he was hired, he was told to look out for. And in all those years and going to every single facility, I think he, he named two or three he never got to out of the 150 something facilities, he'd never seen stacking once. That's one. But are, is it yes. taught, is, is this something that's <clears throat> taught? If it, it, it's just that no one ever does it, um, ha, why would necessarily putting one box on top of another what, what would put someone on notice? The fact that you haven't, you haven't seen it in other places still doesn't tell me that it necessarily that it's a, it's a standard. I, I agree, it, it, it points in that direction, but is there, what, what else is there that puts them on notice that that's a standard? Okay, let's talk about uh, instruction in the industry for, for practitioners <clears throat> and licensees. Donna Backus testified on behalf of the board. She's the coordinator of the Mortuary Science Program at Chandler Gilbert Community College, which is the only school for mortuary science in Arizona. So most of the board's witnesses, well, not the board's witnesses, but most of actually the appellant's witnesses went and testified that they went through this program. Uh, she testified that at Chandler Gilbert Community College, they, the program specifically teaches students not to stack. It's in the lectures and it's in the written materials provided to students, which were admitted as part of the exhibits here. Um, Jim Starks, uh, who is a, more of a national expert. He's the dean of the ICCFA, and that's the International Cremation and Cemetery Funeral Association, ICCFA. He's the dean of their crematory college. He teaches a cremation course every year at their big you know, national, uh, I don't know what you call it, but long story short is he also teaches in, in their course not to stack, and they use an example of a, he testified that they, in part of that course, they have a picture of a, of two by of two boxes stacked in a van is kind of an example of don't do this. Um, when we look at uh, you're talking about the mortuary science program and there's yes. only one it's in Chandler. Yes. Once you finish that program, you take a state board of some kind. I'm assuming to get your license. 
That's correct. And during that testing proceeding, do they talk about stacking? Is that one of the questions? Is that one of the subjects that's addressed by that licensure test? I don't know f what is it. The state board, actually, Arizona State, this is not in, in the record, though, so, but just from my knowledge of the I'm curious. This, Arizona uses a national test. You can either take the national, the national funeral, <laughs> funeral science exam or national funeral examination, <clears throat> or you take the Arizona State equivalent. But the rub is that the Arizona equivalent is the, we use the national one. So you, by taking the Arizona one, you're still taking the national one, just you're calling it the Arizona, you can only be licensed in Arizona. So Arizona does use the national test. And Donna Back has testified with regard to the cremation, the crematory license or the cremationist license, which is much simpler to get than a funeral director's license. The cremationist license is a one day program. And she testified that the test they give in that does have asked a question about is stacking permitted under, under, basically it says you may stack containers, true or false, and the answer was false. So she did testify that that is in the, in the materials. Uh, Caressa Hughes testified on behalf of the board. She was, uh, with regard to stacking issues, she's the managing director of SCI, which is the largest funeral company in the world. Uh, SCI has uh, 34 funeral homes, 11 cemeteries, and nine crematories in the state of Arizona. She testified that SCI does not permit stacking at any of its facilities in Arizona or otherwise. She also, Ms. Hughes is also on the board of directors of the ICCFA, which we mentioned, as well as CANA, which is the Cremation Association of North America. These are national organizations, you know, for, for funeral directors and cremationists. And she's on the board of directors of those companies or of those organizations. And she testified that she had received their permission from the general counsel and the board to t testify on behalf of those organizations that they find stacking to be offensive and not consistent with professional standards. So there was, and well, there was sufficient evidence to, to establish that stacking was against prevailing standards. Even some of the appellant's witnesses themselves testified that they found stacking to be offensive and something they would never do. And so there was some, but, but appellants did present some evidence that a few people did find stacking not offensive, but the ALJ was, the, was in the best position to resolve conflicting expert opinions like in a Phelps Source Industrial Commission, the, the Court of Appeals was clear that the, it's, the ALJ has a prerogative to resolve those those con, those uh, disputes. Additionally, in this case, we had another layer of review because Just in terms of what's the better practice. But it, it seems yeah. to me you have to you have to be on notice that this <clears throat> that this violates an industry standard. And if it's someone who's just saying, "Well, I wouldn't do it," I see other, but <clears throat> I've seen other people who do it. I personally wouldn't do it. Is, is that enough to say that it's it's the industry standard? If that was all there was, that probably wouldn't be enough. But here we have the major industry trade groups. We have the, the only college that teaches it. We have the largest company that operates in Arizona saying there's no stacking. We have the board's investigator saying they've never seen it. All of this evidence does reach a, reach a level where it's undeniable that that, that that is a prevailing standard. And the notice issue, it kind of runs back into the it's, constitutional it, law. If it's so clear cut, why isn't there just a rule that says that? I don't know. I mean, that's. That would be nice in a lot of situations, but even let me. And it would give everybody notice, and there would be no dispute, yeah. and you wouldn't have to call all these experts to testify about industry standards because yeah. there's just a rule. Well, that because would be that would be great, and that, maybe that would be a future, you know, <laughs> endeavor for the funeral board. But the rules a, as they stand, they are what they are. And interestingly, in Gala versus Arizona Medical Board, that's in our brief. Uh, the legis this is another case where someone challenged a statute as being unconstitutionally vague, which prohibited any conduct or practice that is or might be harmful to the public, to the health of the patient or the public. The court found that was not vague and that there was appropriate notice. And it, it said something to the effect of, the legislature need not define statutory terms with linguistic precision, nor need it describe every possible boundary of the statute's application. Harmful to the public seems a uh, little clearer than dignity of the deceased. Let's, well, let me give you another example. Uh, Etheridge versus Arizona State Board of Nursing, the, the, the court found, the Court of Appeals found this, this statute not vague. Failure to maintain minimum standards of acceptable and prevailing nursing practice. That reads just like the second half of that, the disrespect rule. You, know, you shall not engage in conduct that constitutes disrespect for the deceased, contrary to the prevailing practices and standards in the state. So according to Etheridge, you could just, the, the board could probably have had a, a rule that said, you shall not engage in conduct that is contrary to the, to the prevailing standards in the state. And that, but under did, ethics, that would have been I thought it was a harm related. See, to me, it seems like a different. If you're relating a professional standard to harm, mm -hmm. then 
clearly practices that could result in harm are easy to prove and you don't necessarily have to anticipate all types of harm. Correct. But here we're talking about dignity and that's why I asked the question to, to counsel, was there any indication that the stacking that was engaged in in this case caused any harm? Well, in this case we have, I mean, it's, it's, it's a unique situation. This is much different than the medical field because here everybody's already dead so you're not going to harm a deceased person. But it's potent but what appellants seem to be arguing is that as long as it's behind closed doors and no one sees it, I guess no one could be harmed. But there, as Jim Starks testified, the death care industry is built upon respect. That's testified. That's the training they get. That's part of what they do. Just because no bodies happen to have fallen out of these things or were smashed in this instance doesn't mean that, that why people shouldn't stack is because that leads to that potential. So there was some testimony. Uh, Starks in particular testified that there could be damage to the body below. That also in stacking, while stacking and transport, there could be all, you know, these things can slide around. And, and certainly the body could be damaged. There's also testimony that these containers do leak sometimes. Um, but the critical thing was the disrespect. There was, you know, several practitioners testified that they find it extremely why, offensive. Why isn't, it seems to me that that's more critical, that that, that should, I find that more persuasive than just the general notion of it's disrespectful to be stacked on, on top of someone else. I'm, seems to me it, more compelling that there's a possibility that the box is going to leak or that if it's stacked uh, there there would be a problem that way as opposed to simply it's disrespectful to be underneath someone that doesn't seem to be very disrespectful we see in cemeteries all the time where there's stacked graves just being on top or below someone that may be the case but i don't see i don't think you'll find graves where they're stacking strangers on top of one another and the testimony uh but even the people the appellants were in a military installation you, you have rows um go out here to the phoenix cemetery and you have yes. rows of these aren't families they're just rows of, of mil people that have been i would have to look at that but i would expect it, and there was testimony about this that the practitioners that testified on behalf of the board do not consider it stacking if you're putting people on racks there was testimony with regard to uh, app appellant frank lambert putting you know up to eight cardboard boxes of humans three stacking three high in the back of his van uh, other experts said, you know, that, that, that's a no-no from the appellants or from that, the That goes more to the potential for the box could break or something as opposed to just the, the notion of it's the dignity of being underneath someone. It, isn't, isn't that your, your better argument? That, well, that may be the better argument. That's clear. Certainly, <laughs> it's, and you haven't heard appellants say much about that. I mean, it's pretty hard to argue with smashing a, a, someone underneath someone or, or fluids dripping. But... There was, there was substantial evidence. This was a three-day hearing. The ALJ heard substantial evidence on the, on the disrespect issue and found that the board's experts did establish that was a standard of care. And even in the manuals. You have to admit that that disrespect seems pretty nebulous. I mean, how disrespectful to whom? I mean, you could probably line up people in the public and half would say, eh, no, it's not a problem. The other half would say, oh, yeah, I'm offended by it. And there'd be some that say, I don't even think cre cremation is respectful. That, that's all correct. Um, but, and, and that, that sort of touches on the uh, the case I'd love to talk about a little bit that the, the appellants cited in their reply brief that the two abortion cases, in particular the Ninth Circuit Tucson Women's Clinic versus Eden, because I think that gets at what you're seeing in that one could say hey, disrespect is, is it's such a vague term, you and I may disagree on that. And in, in the Eden case, this is where they struck down an abortion statute for um, facilities requiring them to ensure that the patient is afforded of the following rights. Uh, to be treated with consideration, respect, and full recognition of the patient's dignity and individuality. So that's a similar statute that I think that you're, you're there. The court said the, that that statute was struck down because, in particular, the court of appeals said that, or sorry, the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals said that um, it subjected physicians to discipline based upon not on their own objective conduct, but on the subjective opinion of others, and that was concerning. And if this statute in particular, if Rule 4301, sorry, Rule 412301 only said you shall not engage in conduct that's disrespectful, period, that would, I think you would have, that the, it would be the same sort of case there. Because again, it's up to someone's subjective viewpoint. Here, it says you shall not engage in conduct that's disrespectful to the deceased, contrary to prevailing standards and practices in, of the profession in this state. That takes it out of the purely subjective realm to the objective realm. So that if a family member comes and complains to the board about a practitioner and says, that was really offensive the way they handled my funeral, the board will only discipline if not just due to the subjective feelings of the family member, but 
they look at the conduct of the licensee and say, did you fall below the professional standards? So it's not just someone's subjective viewpoint. It's does it uh, comport with the professional standards? And there was plenty of testimony that in the funeral industry, treating people as individuals and as though they were still alive. There's testimony that you treat them as though they're still alive, you treat them with respect. And the conduct that the appellants were saying, such as uh, one of the appellants experts testified that they thought it was appropriate to take <laughs> one box off a shelf, put it onto a gurney, and then grab another one off because they didn't want to bring it all the way down and hurt their back, so they'll just use, use someone's loved one as a, a table, essentially. Things like that, I don't see how that can be consistent with respecting the deceased, treating them as individuals. When we talk about consistent with industry standards, et cetera, when those standards evolve, how do practitioners receive notice that they have evolved and that they must now comply with this extra step to be in accordance with your role? Well, as practitioners, and, and the case law uh, cited in our brief also mentions this, practitioners are expected to be up to speed on the current trends within their industry. Uh, the board did, or, or the ALJ did find that perhaps in the remote past, you know, 10 to 15 years ago, Maybe stacking was okay, but it wasn't stacking. It was not okay currently. Are but there requirements in the, in, of continuing education? Well, I was going to mention that they have continuing education, just like attorneys do, and so they have, you know, I think 12 hours a year they have to do. So I, I don't think that. And is this part of the curriculum? Is stacking part of the curriculum on the continuing education? If, if it was, my understanding, they have just like attorneys. I mean, you have a book of 100 courses you could take, mm -hmm. but it is in the ICCFA's crematory. Uh, ICCFA's, uh, their, their cremation college, that's within their, the, the dean of that college testified it's in their curriculum. Uh, MC, it was formerly MCC, now it's Chandler Gilbert. They testified that's in their curriculum. The actual companies that, that make the retorts, those are the ovens, it's in their written manuals not to stack, either in transport or in the facility. So this is written down in a lot of places. It's in official curriculums. The national organizations find it offensive. Uh, you know, there's substantial evidence that, that stacking is contrary to prevailing standards. If, if you don't have any current questions, I wanted to address some, um, uh, address the bias and prejudice issue. Before um, you do that, can okay. you address the refrigeration issue? Yes. Just the testimony came from a calculation done by this many bodies, this did you find that to be flawed? I mean, you no. were there or you've read the transcripts. I didn't see that the ALJ thought that there, it was not reputable or not accurate. Give me a moment, Your Honor. I mean, I can't have the guy. You can provide up with me. I have the ALJ decision here, and it is it is clear that, you know. Aha. And put me on the spot here, but I'm going to find that because that is the ALJ did specifically address that. Freezing. Yeah. I believe it's the first first finding of fact. Okay. In any event, okay. I do have it, Your Honor. My time's dwindling down, but I mean. We've reviewed it. Yeah, you reviewed it. So it does. Apparently. She does mention that at least in something the fact that ALJ does not specify which days, but she said during at least some days during the summer of 2015, more than 31 bodies were on premises. That was basically the evidence, consistent with the appellants that actually worked in, in the crematory. They were clear that they can only cremate 50, the most bodies they've ever cremated in a day was 15, and the most they can hold is 16. So days where they had more than 31. Just by the math, it, it, they, they couldn't freeze them all, or sorry, they couldn't refrigerate them all. And even in days when they had 31, I think, if anything, the, the board's spreadsheet undercounted because there was three, there are three retort, there was testimony that there are three retorts in the facility and that it takes at least two hours for the cremation cycle. So if they had 31 bodies in a day, even if they did, even if they cremated all day, they couldn't all be in the, uh, I'm trying to know how to put this, but. Basically, only 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 three should be out of the refrigerator at any one time. So the way the the uh, I guess I'm not rephrasing that right, but long story short is in our brief we discuss how likely that that spreadsheet, if anything, undercounted the, the number of bodies. And regardless, we had three different instances where people showed up at the crematory and there were bodies just out, including one where the uh, 
responsible cremationist Jesse Walsh Alexis had went to Circle K and left. So their statements where they're trying to re re the facts and say that we just had them out for a moment to, to move around things, it can't be the case if you, if you actually left the building. I would like to hear your, your response to the allegation of bias. Okay. Director. Um, so, as the court's aware, absent a showing of actual bias or prejudice, the board is presumed to be fair. And all of the allegations here with, the, with regard to bias and prejudice concern statements made by the executive director. Uh, but the evidence was undisputed that the executive director did not initiate the complaints. The complaints were initiated by funeral directors in the community. And the evidence was also undisputed that the executive director did not uh, supervise the investigation and did not participate did not participate in the strategy of the investigation and did not do, conduct the final administrative decision. And appellants cite the Horn versus Polk case, which I think is completely an opposite, because in the Horn versus Polk case, you had, and you, have high, you have High County Attorney finding a violation, not just finding probable cause, but finding a violation and issuing essentially a citation to, to Tom Horn, then participating materially in strategy for the case, then the ALJ decides and then the Alpine County Attorney then overturns the ALJ's decision back to her original decision. And there the court said, you can't have the same person making the charging decision, participating in the strategy, and then doing a final administrative decision. Same person influencing Influence. people who are doing it. Is that, so this completely yes. takes it out of it if it's, if yes, here we have the board. We don't, if, if the executive director, you know, sent the case to OA, that didn't happen, and then participate in strategy, and then overturn the ALJ decision, then we would have that situation, but here, the, there's been, they've made no connection between statements made by the executive director and actions of the board or the ALJ. And in fact, when asked about uh, the executive director's influence over the board, uh, James Woods, who is the appellant's, the owner of Sorrel Valley, he said, I don't know what Rudy's influence is, he's the executive director, I don't know what his influence over the board is. So even their own witness acknowledged that their statement about the board being biased and prejudiced was speculative. And that mere speculation should not be sufficient to overturn an, an ALJ decision. And if the board was so biased and prejudiced, if you notice, they, they referred it out to the ALJ and the board adopted the ALJ's findings of facts and conclusions of law. They did go uh, well beyond the uh, ALJ's suggested punishment. They did. I'm out of time. I'd love to talk about that, but next time. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Can you, if you know how, add uh, one minute to the rebuttal time? That's about how long we gave you extra. Thank you very much. That's appreciated. Let me touch first upon uh, Horn versus Polk. Look to that case for over overarching principles regarding due process, the need to have a neutral adjudication, one that's fair in appearance and fair in reality. That's why that case is cited. There were some questions asked about the material produced by the board's investigators regarding refrigeration. She produced two charts. One was marked as a respondent's exhibit. One was marked as an appellant's exhibit. The respondent's exhibit, uh, excuse me, the, uh, the board's exhibit showed a graph charting out containers received by Sawara on a daily basis. The second chart, again prepared by the board's investigator but marked as appellant's exhibit, showed the number of cremations that were done each day. You'll see a footnote in the uh, administrative law judge's recommended decision talking about these two graphs. And she remarks that the graph showing the um, cremations said they could do 18 a day, whereas the, the testimony was more like they could only do about 15 or 16. So she muses about why don't these two jive? And that's the problem with the, the work done by the investigator. They don't add up at the end of the day. Council. Thank you. Were there any further questions? Yeah. Okay. Council, thank you so much for your arguments. We're going to take this matter under advisement and we'll issue a written decision shortly. At this point, we're gonna take a brief recess to prepare for our next argument.